This is Casey James. I don't know where exactly I am. I don't know what's going on. There's a lot I don't know. But I'm going to figure it out. It's late. The kind of late where you move and find that the cold air has solidified you into position. That your hands can no longer do anything besides type and your eyes have dried out from too long not blinking. It's been three days since I woke up here, in a nice but slightly run-down bed-and-breakfast hotel, in a small town on the coast, in the middle of nowhere. And I haven't really been sleeping. Not well, anyway. I'm... Well, tense doesn't really even begin to cover it. Let's just stick with I'm not sleeping well. And when I do doze off, I wake up from strange, confusing dreams. The sort that Victorian novels might have described as queer. I don't know. Half the time I don't even remember them. Tonight, I do. There were hands touching me in the dark. Shadows that moved on their own across a field of sunflowers. A house that was somehow sentient, embodied in a voice I almost recognised. Not the bridge house, but something like it. And then somewhere else. Maybe a hospital. Or an old-style asylum. Like you see in period movies. Or some university science department. Some place that was all institutional beige and white, rusted steel panels and old carpet, with gleaming surgical equipment on the walls and weird disturbing devices with straps and electrodes hidden in back rooms. And people, students or researchers, people, people in white lab coats with dead vacant eyes who summoned something horrible out of the empty, welling void between atoms. And I don't mean an explosion. I'm not entirely sure what I do mean. The clock on the laboratory wall was running backwards, and the numbers didn't make any sense. It's one of the signs of being in a dream, you know, not being able to read anything. Words and numbers shift when you look away from them, sometimes even when you're looking right at them. It's paranoid, but I keep trying to read book titles on the shelves in the shop windows on Kingsport's main street, just to check. That's the name of the town, Kingsport. It has one main street, leading from the edge of the woods down to the docks, and the beach that stretches along the harbour up to the cliffs, and at least five curio and antique shops. There's a post office and three bookshops, including one second-hand place that pulls roller shutters down over the windows at night. Ask me how I know. No, don't. It's depressing that I've done enough nighttime wandering the last few days to know which shops have shutters on their windows, and which ones I can linger in front of to make sure I can still read the titles of the books in the windows. I do, you know. Every time I walk down there, I'm doing it now. It's three in the bloody morning, but I can't sleep. And the latest dream. The one about something touching me in the dark. It's left me restless. Itchy. I need to be doing something. Anything, really. So I'm going for a walk in the middle of the night. Down the darkened main street towards the beach. And I'm reading book titles in the windows in case I'm still dreaming. It bothers me that I can't remember what any of them say. They make perfect sense, but when I look away, the words just run out of my mind like melted butter. Stepping outside the hotel was like walking into a novel, atmospheric as a postcard. The light from the streetlights is too much to be afraid of the dark, but too little to see clearly. 
I halfway expect a werewolf or something to show up. The wind gusts, makes the street light flicker like a candle as the trees move across it and back. My hair falls down over my shoulders and across my face. The same colour in this weird, colourless lack of light as the darkness is. Through it, I see her for the first time. The ghost. She is a shadow, a sense of movement where I expected none. She is pale-skinned, pale-haired, and electric, walking through the semi-darkness of the early morning. She is unexpected. I do not immediately know that she is a ghost, but she is clearly something. I follow her, obviously. What else would I do? She doesn't look back, but I think she's aware of me. And it doesn't occur to me until we reach the sandy beach of Kingsport Bay that I have no idea who or what she is. The inescapable certainty of dream logic tells me that she isn't human, and I trust that instinct. I would almost think that she's something like Ariel. She isn't Ariel, even if she sort of looks like her. But that feels wrong, too. I follow her right out to the edge of the water, but I'm not a complete idiot, so I stop before stepping into the surf. I'll admit that part of that is my lingering fear of the Vodnik things from the bridge house, although my brain dredges up fairy tales and myths about things like Rosalka and those Irish water horses that sometimes turn into pretty young men and drag you into the lochs to drown you. Does Ireland have locks, or are they just lakes there? My ghost laughs <laughs> and turns around, finally. There's something not quite right about her face. It's so very perfectly symmetrical, with silver-blue eyes like static on a monitor in the dark, or dying electrons, and that pale hair drifting in the wind and the moonlight, like a magnesium flare of white fire. But it's just a bit off. She reminds me of a bird of prey, maybe an owl, something predatory and inhuman and sharp, but also beautiful. In the way that snow is beautiful, though, or broken glass, sharp, like I said. Also, her face is weirdly flattened out, like a mask, or the face of an actual owl. I admit it. I stare, just for a second. Are you coming? She asks. I, honestly, I hadn't expected her to speak. I wasn't, up until that moment, entirely sure that she was real. I managed to stammer something, but I don't think it's actual words as much as vague sounds of confusion. My ghost laughs and turns around again, walks along the beach, on the edge of the water where the waves lap at the sand. She doesn't leave any footprints. I do. I follow her along the beach, drawn along by that sense of narrative inevitability that got me into trouble in the bridge house, to the tide pools at the base of the cliffs. I've heard some of the others, the people at the hotel, who all know me and speak to me as if I should know them too, talking about the tide pools, about collecting shells and going skinny dipping in the cold water, but the water isn't cold now. It's warm, steaming like a hot spring or a bathhouse. The steam winds around my ankles as I get closer, and if I were properly awake, rather than sleep deprived and half convinced that I am actually dreaming right now, I would approach a ghost in a tide pool with a lot more caution than this. But I'm not. I'm not alert enough to even think of the danger until after I've waded out into the pool. I stop knee-deep in the warm water, 
and wonder what I'm doing. There's a cave in the cliffside ahead of me. Its dark mouth yawns, whispering the repeated shush, shush of the waves as they hit the stone of the cliffs. The ghost laughs again as she steps into the shadows of the cave mouth, but she doesn't turn to look at me. She might not even be laughing at me, although I think she probably is. I follow her. I know, not my smartest decision. The chill of the cave raises goose flesh on my arms in spite of the warm water, and a shiver crawls down my spine as I step into the darkness. What are you looking for? Her voice echoes. Sounds like it's coming from everywhere at once. I have to find someone, I tell her, looking around to see where she's gone, thinking of Eddie. A hand slides across my shoulder and back, cold as a dead thing, then it's gone in the dark. I turn around anyway. She's not there. What are you doing? I ask. Mm, what, what do, do you, you think? think? As she speaks, I turn to follow the sound of her voice, and I catch a glimpse of her moving away again, just this pale flash in the shadows, almost luminescent. So I follow her. I, I don't know, I tell her. If I did, I wouldn't ask. In my defense, I do think about turning around and going back to the hotel instead. I think about it, about lying awake in my comfortable bed, in that comfortable room, staring at the ceiling and knowing that there was someone, or something maybe, out here that might have answers. And then I follow the ghost further into the cave instead of turning around and going back out to the moonlit, desolate beach and the empty town full of people who know me and who I have never seen before. Yeah, you see, it sounds less idiotic when you put it in context. Besides, half a dozen steps in, we've turned a corner and it's dark, and I can't see the exit anymore. It's the middle of the bloody night, I'm in a tidal cave, and I don't have a torch with me. The knee-deep water is still warm, although I can't see it steaming anymore, given the darkness. The only light is that wisp of white ahead of me, not even human-shaped now, just a faint ghost light. By this time, I am starting to think that this might have been a bad idea. I'm soaked to the knee, my shoes are soggy and full of water, although at least they'll stop me from slicing my feet open on the rocks or standing on a venomous sea anemone or something, even if they're uncomfortably soggy. And no one knows where I am. I don't know where I am. The ghost keeps moving, though, so I keep following her. I follow her for a long time. It doesn't feel nearly as long as it must be, but there's sunlight coming in through a hole in the ceiling when I finally catch up. Although, maybe that's not quite right. Not the part about sunlight, there's definitely a faint, bluish, early morning glow coming in from somewhere. And I can actually see again. I mean the catching up part. It's more like she stops and waits for me. She's standing, hip deep in water, in the middle of what should be a cave, but isn't. The walls are much too smooth for that, and painted with murals that I can barely make out in the pre-dawn twilight, and the floor changed at some point from rock and sand to tiles. I'm still wearing my soggy trainers, so I think I can be forgiven for not really noticing when that happened. 
It's only just bright enough to see, but that's still enough light to make the shadows darker, soft-edged but defined in a way that they weren't when it was all just dark. The ghost turns and grins at me, sharp teeth in that oddly flat, pale owl face of hers, and I have to wonder how I ever mistook her for human, because she doesn't look it. She looks just like the shadows, rippling and moving in inexplicable and disturbing, unshadow-like ways. I don't even know why I'm surprised. When I brush against a wall, and my shoulder goes through the shadow there, as if it's empty space. But I am. I flinch back from the wall and the shadows, and in my peripheral vision they writhe and move like the words on the spines of those books in the windows, letters forming and falling out of my brain in some alien language. The ghost moves one hand through the steam, still curling and drifting up from the warm water, and meets my eyes with her strange silver-blue gaze. Then she lowers herself into the water, all slithery and undulating, like she has no bones to speak of, like a snake. And then I'm quite certain just how bad an idea this was, all of this, because she is a snake, a long, white, glistening snake sliding under the surface of the steaming, shadow-drenched water with barely a ripple. Adrenaline is a hell of a drug. The dreamy lassitude that drew me along behind her vanishes in a stinging tingle of fight or flight across my skin and down to my fingertips, and I suddenly regret not bringing a weapon with me. In the water, shadows writhe and move on their own, which is really distressing, since last time that happened, they tried to grab me and pull me into some sort of weird eldritch ocean dimension or something, and I can hear my heart pounding in my ears. The snake glides past my leg in the water. I flinch away from it and start looking for a way out, out of the water, out of the cave that isn't a cave, just out. The ghost's laughter follows me as I wade <laughs> frantically towards the other side of the lake, hoping for a way out. <laughs> It echoes around the room, and the shadows catch on my ankles and trip me up like brambles, like I'm wading through a thicket instead of a lake of warm water, steaming and smoking in the chill early morning air. On the walls, the mural seems to move as well, grotesque goblinoid figures with antlers like a stag, or horns like a goat, caper and cavort around some sort of stone circle. I try not to look. I don't know what warns me, a ripple in the water or some vestige of self-preservation instinct, but I throw myself to the side as the snake charges me, once, then again. It circles away, invisible in the water as I pick myself up. I'm glad the water is still fairly shallow, I'm thoroughly drenched not in any immediate danger of drowning or having to swim anywhere. The snake charges me again, and I hear it coming this time, making this rattling snarl that makes my whole body want to freeze up. Instead, I grab at it as it goes to bite me, or whatever it was going to do. Smack its stupid, blunt, snaky head into my side, maybe. In case anyone ever tries to tell you otherwise, Grabbing a moving snake is both difficult and stupid. If you can run away instead, do that. There is only one place that you can hold a snake where it can't just turn around and bite you, which is right behind the head, at the back of the skull. And that doesn't stop it from wriggling and struggling and whipping the rest of its body around. And that's even assuming you can get the damn thing. Also, Panic does not make you any more coordinated than you are otherwise. Or at least, it doesn't make me any more coordinated than I am otherwise. So yeah, I grab at the snake, more in a panic than any sort of rational thought, and I miss. I mean, I grab it, sure, but not that one spot behind the head. So it turns around and bites me, 
just sinks its fangs into my arm while it stares at me with those flat, silver-blue eyes. It hurts. That moment of shock and pain is enough for the snake, or the animate shadows, or something to wrap around my legs and pull me down into the water, and then I'm underwater and I can't breathe and I'm drowning and thrashing like I haven't been swimming since before I could walk. I'm pretty sure I breathe in some water. I definitely swallow some. It's salty, warm as blood, and it has that same metallic tang to it. I'm aware, in that moment, that if I drown right now, I won't wake up again, even if I am dreaming. I won't wake up. And then I stop thinking about it, about anything, because the snake is there in front of me, with that weirdly almost human owl face instead of the blunt snout of a snake, and I swear it's trying to crawl into my mouth and down my throat while it drowns me. I really need to breathe right now, and trying to keep my mouth shut is, well, it's not easy, and I'm clawing at the snake, or the shadows, or whatever it is that's wrapped around my throat, and trying to get my feet under me to get my head out of the water, and it's not working. The last thing I hear, as my vision starts to go dark at the edges, is Walker's voice, sounding as much inside my head as outside it, saying, Oh, I don't think so. Not today. I think the phrase is, Get away from her, you bitch. Get your own damn host. This one's taken. <laughs> 